Well, happy fall, everyone, and welcome to week three of our Revelation study. I have a few short announcements before we turn to the lecture. Next Thursday, October 3rd, each group will have a during class fellowship. You can plan to stay in your group for the whole morning from 9.30 to 11. For the first half of your time together, you'll discuss the lesson as usual, and the last part of your morning will be fellowship time. And then, of course, you can watch the recorded lecture after that. The following week on October 10th, our first mini study for our Revelation study begins. This three week mini study titled The Seven Churches will cover Jesus's message to the seven churches in Revelation in chapters two and three. And we'd love for you to invite whoever the Lord would put on your heart. You can give them the link on the screen, www.bsfinternational.org backslash try BSF. And when they go there, they can sign up to receive the mini study materials by email. Well, I would love for you to know that BSF is a global ministry supported solely by your voluntary contributions. You are welcome to give to the work of BSF as God leads you. We tithe 25% to the Columbus Chinese Christian Church from our weekly offering to help defray the cost of hosting our class. And we also give a monthly contribution to Victory Ministries for hosting our satellite group. Even though we are not yet back in person, you can still contribute to this ministry by giving online at mybsf.org or bsfinternational.org. You can also contribute by mailing your contribution to BSF headquarters using the information found on the screen or in the box on the lecture recording. You can send it to Bible Study Fellowship, P.O. Box 675241 in Dallas, Texas, 75267. Your giving makes BSF possible and we greatly appreciate your generosity. All right, well, would you pray with me and we will turn to lecture. Father, we are humbled that you would allow us to see the precious things that you have to say in Revelation. God, would you quiet our hearts and open our ears to hear what you have to say to each one of our hearts. We welcome your Holy Spirit, Lord, to come and teach us these things. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to date myself here, but when I was in high school, a favorite movie was Back to the Future. For those of you like my kids and are like, Mom, what are you talking about? Well, in the movie, Marty McFly has a quirky scientist friend named Doc. You know, the kind with the mechanical contraptions all around and crazy white hair that's always trying to keep up with his head. Well, Doc invented a time machine, a DeLorean sports car, and the flux capacitor could send the car both back in time and to a future time. It will be helpful today and this whole year, really, to think of ourselves in a time machine. So would you open up your Bible, this book that we love? Next week, what we've uh, been waiting for, we'll start going verse by verse through Revelation. But today we're going to overview the entire book. So let's look at chapter one, verse 19, where Jesus tells John to do this. He says, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. We're going to need that flux capacitor to take us back in time to see the future and so many points in between. Now, I like nice and tidy, but Revelation is anything but that. It's not laid out in easy chronological order, plainly telling us what to expect and how history will play out. In fact, if you came here to find out exact times and timelines, and the decoding strategy to unlock the imagery and mystery of the end times, you'll be sorely dissatisfied. So often we come to any book of the Bible with things we want to know and questions we want answered, but then God shows us the things we need to know and what he wants us most to know, which is ultimately just himself. Knowing him though always leaves us with a deeper satisfaction than we could have ever hoped for. 
and you can be deeply assured of that satisfaction this year. Let's look at verse 3 because it's actually guaranteed. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. The blessing of deep satisfaction that you can have today as you believe and act on these words is found in the main thing that you can know today, which is Jesus's return and victory gives help for today and hope for tomorrow. Jesus's return and victory gives help for today and hope for tomorrow. We'll look at this truth in two divisions. My first division is Revelation, the backdrop. And my second division is Revelation, the big screen. So that's Revelation, the backdrop, and Revelation, the big screen. All right, well, let's start with the backdrop. Most scholars believe John, the apostle who wrote the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is the author. He and his brother James were among the earliest disciples of Jesus. John was the disciple Jesus loved, an incredible description of their deep relationship. And he was the first of the 12 disciples to believe in the resurrection. Scholars discern by the time John wrote Revelation in his later years, James had been martyred and John was in exile on the island of Patmos, both because they stood firm and unwavering in both speaking and standing up for Christ. Now there's debate whether the book was written in AD 65 when Rome was under Emperor Nero, or most likely around AD 95 during the reign of Domitian. Regardless, John's original audience in the seven churches of Asia was facing intense pressure to worship the emperor. Christians were being forced to either compromise their faith or suffer extreme persecution, even death. So John, suffering himself, writes to comfort suffering Christians. This book, intended to comfort and give a message of hope to those pressed by difficult circumstances in the first century, still speaks the same message to us today. In just the first 10 years of this century, nearly 1.1 million believers were killed for their faith. This doesn't account for those beaten, jailed, raped, kidnapped, and the like, all because they worship the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. We may not be suffering to that extent, but let's make this personal. How are you challenged to stand up for the cause of Christ today in the face of opposition? There are plenty of opportunities in our homes, in our schools, businesses, communities, and beyond. What pressures are you facing or where is suffering touching your life because of your faith? In Jesus is how we persevere and have victory, remembering God is on his throne, and we're going to see that over and over as we study this year. Well, continuing with the backdrop, Revelation is a letter containing apocalyptic prophecy. It has a series of dramatic visions and images of things like lamps and lampstands, a dragon, and a beast with ten horns and seven heads. These are all meant to convey meaning and truth through symbols. The symbols represent literal realities, but they don't portray the exact way the events will transpire. So Revelation isn't meant to be read like a movie script, even though historical and literal events are predicted and described. Instead, try reading it not as detailed and exact descriptions but as the picturesque and symbolic nature of poetry or Jesus's parables. And no surprise, there are lots of interpretations about what all these symbols mean. And so as another aspect of its backdrop, let's talk about four basic ways to interpret or view Revelation. 
The first is the preterist view, which sees most of the book's events as fulfilled by the early church with Jerusalem's destruction in AD 70 and before the fall of the Roman Empire. It's seen as, symbol as a symbolic account of the first century, except for Jesus's second coming. The second view is the historicist view, which believes Revelation describes the present age of the church, beginning with the churches in the Roman Empire to the consummation, <clears throat> like a chronological roadmap through church history. Only a few of the passages of Revelation await future fulfillment. A third is the futurist view, which depicts the drama after chapter three as happening at the end of human history and around the second coming of Christ. The fulfillment of these vivid scenes remains future. And fourth is the idealist view. <clears throat> this approach sees everything as symbolic and representing the ongoing battle between God's good and Satan's evil in repeated cycles. So that's four basic ways to approach Revelation. How does BSF interpret it? Well, BSF reflects a combination of these views. Certainly, the book is set in the first century, and the symbols relate to the battle between God and Satan and good and evil. BSF sees some partial fulfillments throughout history. However, we also believe the book predicts a future time of intensified tribulation in the end time prior to the second coming of Christ. At that time, Jesus will judge the unrepentant and reign with his saints in an earthly kingdom, which will ultimately transition into the eternal kingdom of the new creation. Well, I said last week that all scripture is equally true, but not equally clear. So we will recognize the different schools of interpretive thought, but we won't press the details into specific timelines or speculate about the who, what, or how of God's promised events. Simply put, we'll approach this climatic book to learn what it reveals about Jesus and God's promised victory that consummates human history. As we humbly respect varying views, I ask that you hold your opinions with humility too, considering others' thoughts with respect. It's more important to live rightly and love well than to dogmatically stand on details that we can't fully understand. Like one Bible teacher said, we can agree to disagree agreeably. So I'm sure you're catching on. There's a lot of details concerning these things that we can get lost in, especially amidst the high drama of Revelation. But we don't want to lose, lose sight of what gives us hope as we ponder what's less certain. So let's take a look at one significant theme of Revelation as our final aspect of the backdrop. backdrop. Rising as an integral theme woven throughout the book is the centrality of God and his Son and the work of the Holy Spirit, all three in harmony with each other and collaborating together in the marvelous and mysterious unity of what's called the Trinity. God is one God, yet he's three in one. Three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each functioning in their own role and way, yet they're equally God. Throughout the Bible, we see the Godhead communicating with one voice and one purpose, and Revelation reveals the cooperation of the Father, Son, and Spirit as this world moves into its final chapter and eternity. In Revelation, we see God, the Holy Spirit. John's in the Spirit, hearing from the Spirit, watching the Spirit at work on earth and in heaven, and the Spirit beckoning God's people to worship the high and exalted ruler of time and eternity. We see Jesus, God the Son. John seeing Jesus, recognizing Jesus, receiving words from Jesus, falling at the feet of Jesus. This is the same Jesus he'd walked with, talked with, 
laughed with, and ate with. The same Jesus he believed in, cared for, and even laid his head on the chest of. The same Jesus he'd seen mocked, beaten, nailed to the cross, and the same Jesus he saw the empty tomb of, fellowshiped with as his risen Lord, and then watched ascend to heaven, promising he'd come back. As early as chapter four, John's vision takes us to the throne room where God is on his throne, orchestrating and ruling over all history with power, honor, and glory, and holding the scroll of judgment in his hand. It's God the Son at the center of the throne, the Lamb who was slain, the only one worthy to take the scroll and carry out judgment, the victorious one who will return as king. And it's God the Spirit who will be at work in these chapters, carrying all these things towards completion. Just as all three members of the Trinity were actively involved in creation and redemption, they will also be actively involved as history plays out to the end and restoration is fulfilled. How did we take these truths into our lives? Well, when we don't believe in the Trinity, we limit the truth about the wonder of God to what our feeble minds can conceive. To view God as less than he truly is means we fail to recognize the unique blessing of each of the three persons, the multifaceted, ongoing, and eternal work of not only God, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit too. We end up sacrificing the stability and perspective that we crave and desperately need. However, when we believe in our majestic and mysterious God, who's one yet three, we're humbled by their incomprehensible nature and unity. And at the same time, we're touched by the undivided ways the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each love us and work in our lives. It's God who is our creator, father, and knows all things. And when our life and world seem like it's reeling out of control, we can know that it isn't because he's in complete control. It's God the Son who came to walk this earth to put himself in our place, to feel what we feel, to empathize with us in our pain, to be our very life and breath and hope when we feel we have none. It's God, the Holy Spirit, the very person of Jesus Christ himself in us, who's the presence and the power, the voice of truth and our helper for us to keep going when we don't think that we can go anymore. When we intimately know and fellowship with the three persons of the Trinity, it brings incredible peace to our mind and heart, and it draws our heart to a heavenly posture, bowed before God in worship and joyful surrender. And here we can find our first principle of hope. Revelation takes us back to give us present help because God's in control and Jesus will return. Revelation takes us back to give us present help because God's in control and Jesus will return. Well, very early Saturday morning, I heard some hard news from a struggling friend. She's standing strong for her faith, but the battle's raging and it looks like the enemy has the upper hand. My heart was so heavy for her situation as I found myself thinking about Revelation and how the story is going to play out and going to end. I said to the Lord, what are you doing? And was listening for an answer when I looked up and saw the sky. The clouds were looming and dark, but I noticed the rising morning sun shining from behind them was outlining each cloud with a rim of bright light. 
I took a picture, and I think Lisa has it up on the screen. And I wanted to share it with you because I felt God was showing me a bigger picture of what's going on. If we could have our DeLorean zoom up high above the clouds and look at things from God's view, we'd have a settled peace and an understanding of all the darkness on this side because it's actually God's sun, the S-O-N, shining in all his majesty and brilliance from the back side of the clouds creating the outline. Yet we don't have his full understanding and we still have to face the clouds in life. We could admit it's hard, it hurts, it's not fun, it's sad and downright scary at times. But the beauty of revelation is knowing Jesus reigns supreme, God's in control, Jesus is with us, he's fighting for us, the Holy Spirit is in us, and he'll never leave us. As God's people, we're in his care and keeping, and he's coming to our rescue because he promised to come back in victory over death and defeat and take us to be with him to live in safety and peace forever. So how does this truth give you strength to keep going and do the next right thing for Jesus today? We can say, I am different, knowing our returning and victorious Jesus is our very present help. Well, as we turn to our second division, grab your popcorn, get in your DeLorean time machine, and let's take a look at the storyline. We'll go back to look at the future in Revelation, the big screen. Now, if we were at the movies, the theater would quiet and the words of chapter one, verses one through eight would appear on the screen. John opens with a greeting from the triune God who's given him the visions within the book. He gives the reason for the book title in the first five words the revelation from Jesus Christ. What's coming is a revelation, a revealing from Jesus and about Jesus. He promises blessings to all, including you and me, who read and hear and take the book to heart. So don't miss the blessings this year. Stay with us. There's lots of ways Revelation can be divided, but let's look at four visions John saw. Chapters 1, verse 9 through the end of chapter 3 is his first vision of the majestic, glorified Christ befitting all the glory, honor, power, and authority ascribed to him throughout the book. John writes down seven letters addressing seven first century churches containing encouragement and warnings that still apply to Christ's church today. The second vision, chapters four through 18, show us the judge and his judgment. We first see an amazing picture of God's throne room in chapters four and five. God's in charge, seated on the throne, receiving continuous worship. No one's like him, and in his right hand is a sealed scroll. A question rings out through heaven. Who's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? And the answer comes, the lion from the tribe of Judah. John looks and sees not a lion, but a slain lamb, a picture of the victory already won through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus, the worthy one, begins to open the scroll and initiate God's powerful climax of human history. He will defeat evil, redeem his people, transform his creation, and bring great joy in heaven. We move on to chapter six through 18. God has allowed sin to run its dreadful course, and so now there's a series of three cycles of cascading judgments, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. You'll see some interludes that either look backward or forward in time to explain what else God's doing with those he's saving 
and the spiritual powers opposing them as his redemptive plan rolls forward. But two options ultimately present themselves, either worship the beast or worship the lamb. Throughout this section, saints are encouraged to be faithful and endure, knowing God has something better coming. We'll find it a sobering and sad reality, even with increased and intensified judgments, that the unbelieving world becomes more and more obstinate in their rejection of God. As we move through these chapters in our time machine, it'll be like we're wearing a virtual reality helmet the demonic world becomes 3D as Satan's forces, already defeated on the cross, rise in futile but ferocious opposition against God. We also see glimpses of God's final victory. The Lamb stands on Mount Zion with the 144,000 as scenes of judgment fall and the harvest of earth begins. All this leads up to a great battle at Armageddon. God's enemies gather to wage war, but the reality is it's God gathering them to face judgment. Then God judges Babylon, the city epitomizing evil and depravity in contrast to the purity of God's lamb and his people. And God's people rejoice at his righteous justice, crying out, just and true are your ways, O Lord. By the end of Vision 2, we'll gain a new perspective on good and evil, a perspective we desperately need in our world today. Vision 3 is um, chapters 19 and 20, and it begins with a stark contrast to Babylon's defeat. To the Bride of Christ, there's an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus comes from heaven as a white-robed warrior on a white horse with heaven's armies behind him. The faithful and true King of Kings and Lord of Lords conquers Satan's two beasts and all their followers as God's enemies become a footstool for his feet. Satan's then temporarily imprisoned in the abyss and the millennial kingdom is ushered in. Some see this thousand year reign as symbolic Others interpret it as literal. Either way, God's victory remains certain. And now Satan and death are thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever. The third vision ends with God and his great white throne judgment. Those who refuse to turn to God for salvation get what they wanted. An eternity separated from God in the lake of fire. The horrific end for unbelievers stands in contrast to what God has prepared for those who seek forgiveness through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 21 through chapter 22, verse 5, holds the fourth and final vision. John sees a new heaven and a new earth, and the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, comes down from heaven. It's a place unmarred by sin and untouched by evil. With spiritual eyes, we'll see what we all long for, a restored Eden and so much more. The dwelling place of God's people will be with him forever, free from sin, pain, tears, and death. Since curse is reversed, redemption is accomplished, and the garden restored more beautiful than ever. John concludes his book in chapter 22, verses 6 through verses 32, by attesting to his heavenly vision as something we can rely on. It's trustworthy. It's true. It's God's word. As the movie theater quiets again, the final two verses stand tall on the big screen. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. And the last word in Revelation, which is also the last word in the Bible written by God, is 
Amen, which means so be it. Well, Revelation contains details and scenes that we struggle to take in, much less interpret, and it can be overwhelming. But as we try to make sense, let's not miss the heart of Revelation. At the center of this book and the Bible and God's throne is Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah. We talked about it early, but earlier, but it's worth repeating again. All through the Old Testament, it was assumed the messianic king would come as a lion, a military conqueror. But John saw Jesus as a slain lamb. The future victorious kingdom would come through a crucified Messiah. The conquering of evil would and will come through the cross. Jesus, who John knew on earth to be the Lamb of God, became the true Passover Lamb to anyone who puts their trust in him so that they can be redeemed. I like how one author said it. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was his enthronement. So Jesus as a sacrificial and slain, but now risen and conquering lamb, is a crucial theme we'll see all through the book. A willingness to suffer for Christ and persevering in Christ in the midst of suffering is the pathway to ultimate victory for us too. We'll also see the unrivaled attributes of God woven throughout our weeks. The Trinity, as I mentioned earlier, the sovereignty of God, his holiness, righteousness, his wrath, and his grace, mercy, security, and his love. Another theme we'll find is God's plan of redemption that was first promised in the garden when man sinned, then fulfilled in Jesus slain on the cross and his resurrection from death, and now being brought into completion at his return. And flowing from one glorious theme to the next, is Christ's victory over Satan. Jesus returns to vindicate God's people, defeat Satan and all who oppose him, and usher in the eternal state where sin and evil cannot enter. Throughout the book and within the hearts of God's people across the ages, the yearning for God to bring justice and end sin's evil parade has only escalated. Revelation verifies God will vanquish evil, end injustice, and restore the beauty he originally created. All God's people can anticipate and will experience his final victory. And here we have our second principle of hope. Revelation takes us back to give us future hope because Jesus wins and reigns. Revelation takes us back to give us future hope because Jesus wins and reigns. Well, as we climb out of our DeLorean time machine to give the flux capacitor a rest, I'm mindful of the dark and looming clouds in my life and in yours. Where are you looking for hope amidst dark and looming things? How might committing to spend time with the Lord, going back to the future in Revelation for the next 27 weeks, help you have true and lasting hope amidst the dark clouds of life? Because these clouds are real, aren't they? Health issues, mental health issues, broken relationships, hurting loved ones, lost and wayward loved ones, fear of the unknown, loss and the deep pain from that loss, the really thin dime that isn't making the ends meet, demands of parenting, demands of aging parents, the ongoing struggle for marital oneness, the number of dark clouds looming is longer than the number of people listening to me because each of our lives are full of many dark clouds. 
But those dark clouds are for here and now. They are part of God's plan in doing a refining work, purging things in us that need to go. He's strengthening foundations. He's actually advancing his kingdom through these clouds and inviting us to trust him in new and deeper ways. He wants to do a transformational work through our clouds so that on the other side, we'll come out radiant because we look more like Jesus. That's the bright rim lining our every dark cloud. And that gives us hope for today. That is our hope for every day to come and on into the time where time won't be marked by days any longer. While John was banished in exile, I imagine there were some dark clouds for his days there, but Jesus came to say something to him. What will Jesus say to you as you open his word and encounter him this year? Revelation is a book about God and his unfolding plan for history. The final chapter has already been written. The battle has already been decisively won. The promise of the new heavens and earth is yours because you're his. Jesus is reigning right now over all things for the sake of those who are his. He's putting his enemies under his footstool so he can one day say to you, you've suffered, you've been faithful, now enter my kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servant. God's in control. Jesus will return. Jesus wins and Jesus reigns. Jesus is our great help and our great hope. Would you pray with me? Father, would you help us to take to heart the words of Revelation this year? Would you change us and use us and help us to share the hope that we have in you? Even so, come Lord Jesus. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you ladies for joining me and I look forward to uh, seeing you back next week. Take care.